Um, so, hello everyone. I'm Caroline Renault. I'm the executive director of the German American Business Association. And GABA is an alliance of corporations, organizations, and professionals with the purpose of strengthening transatlantic business. Uh, GABA is a nonprofit organization promoting business between California and Germany and is only funded by membership and event fees. And we usually do a lot of panel discussions, social events, networking events, um, and try to get people in touch with each other in person. But unfortunately, right now that's not possible. So we started to do a series of online events because uh, we want our communities to stay in touch, give our GABA members the opportunity to stay connected and exchange some ideas. And um, I do see from the participants that quite a few of you are a member of GABA already. So we really um, appreciate your support at these difficult times. Like I said, we are a nonprofit and um, really um, need the support of, of the community at this time as well. We are organizing all the events for free at the moment because we know it's uh, a difficult time for everyone and we know that people are struggling. So we want to, uh, yeah offer this for free um, to support the community. But if you can, uh, we would also like you to consider to give a small donation of like five, 10 or $20 to GABA uh, for the programs that you are attending so we can keep on organizing these programs. Um, with that, um, I would like to introduce you to our moderator. Um, Jens Weitzel is a co-chair of our Entrepreneurs and Venture Capital Industry Group. And um, yeah, we had the... Uh, Pleasure to, to organize this panel for today. So, yes. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, thanks for the brief introduction. Uh, thanks uh, to everybody for joining today's session. Uh, my name is Jens Weitzel. I'm a managing uh, partner at Yabuzeme Partners. Uh, we are a boutique consulting and advisory firm um, with partners in Silicon Valley, in Paris, and in Tel Aviv. We work with uh, startups to build, launch, and grow their businesses and consult with enterprises to develop and execute the innovation strategies. The COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted the global economy. And so we asked ourselves, you know, how has this affected the funding climate? How do investors look at the market? How do they reassess the market opportunities for startups they have already funded? And how are they dealing with new investment opportunities? Are there market opportunities that were spawned by the pandemic? and possibly others that were diminished or possibly eliminated by the current environment. As we kick off our session on the new funding reality, uh, I'd like to welcome our three panelists uh, to today's session and would like to give them a chance to introduce themselves. Um, maybe yeah. Andrew, would you like to start? Yes, hi, I'm Andrew Ogawa, Managing Partner at Quest Venture Partners. We're an early stage venture capital firm established in 2008. And uh, originally we were a family office. We had good results and we said, how do we make this last for hundred years? Well, we got to bring on some new GPs and outside money. So we embarked on a third party fund and we're happy to say we're on our third fund now with uh, many LPs uh, out of uh, the United States, but also uh, Japan. Um, being the fact that I'm half Japanese, half American, grew up in Japan, attended university in the United States. And then went to an MBA program called Thunderbird where I actually had the opportunity to study German. Uh, and then I, uh, Said if I don't use it on a daily basis, I'll forget it. So I applied for an internship or a practicum at Daimler and then they merged with Chrysler. And then I said, this is a wonderful opportunity for me. So I worked for Daimler for over 10 years in Stuttgart, Tokyo and Detroit. Uh, I've been doing uh, Quest Venture Partners though from 2008 and uh, enjoy every moment of being able to meet with founders and, and discuss uh, potential ideas to invest in. Nice to be here, thank you. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe uh, Pat next? Yeah, this is Pat Guerra, and uh, I'm a member of the Band of Angels. Um, uh, I lead a little educational effort at the band called Art of the Deal, a little tongue-in-cheek there. Uh, and I've been an angel investor and have a portfolio of about 25 companies since uh, 2006. Uh, prior to that, uh, 16 years at Hewlett Packard, uh, 11 at uh, Advanced Micro Devices, and then had some crazy ideas that you could control a large company spend more effectively using the internet and some procurement software, uh, which led me into a series of startups uh, and then also leading my own uh, company that was in the design and manufacturing space uh, where we uh, uh, 
took uh, electronic component data and appended it to uh, the, actually the world supply of electronic component data and made it available in CAD tools. So um, but, uh, again, been uh, a member of the band for quite a while and look forward to participating in the program. Thanks a lot. And uh, maybe last from Hello Ventures, Marco. Yeah, hi, my name is <coughs> Marco Marucci. Um, I hear myself that one. Okay, no, it's not. Um, I uh, run Hella's um, automotive, uh, or uh, Hella is an automotive D1, and I run their uh, venture fund here in San Francisco. Uh, we've been around for four and a half years. I co founded Hella Ventures, and um, we have invested now at, uh, in 15 different companies. Uh, we typically invest relatively close to the corporate parent and are uh, running a system that is, um, I think, um, or hope to think that this is pretty unique in the way that we um, invest only in extremely financially strong targets that at the same time um, have to find a way to work together with the corporate parent. Uh, we wouldn't do the investment otherwise. And we've been doing that now um, for uh, four years. And uh, I would say the last two years have been um, very positive in terms of having done deals with you know, major, um, uh, um, with major um, VC players in, in the Valley and also um, being probably one of the few uh, still investing during this time, uh, actually doubling in size of our team during a pandemic uh, is just um, uh, a sign of how much uh, value uh, we were able to bring to our corporate parent and uh, continuing to do so. And uh, um, yeah, so um, with the same target, of course, also for the VC community. Uh, so um, thank you so much, Jens, for having me and I'm excited uh, for this panel. Excellent, uh, thanks for the introductions. So before we actually get into the questions, I would just like to uh, please have the first poll question come up because we'd like to see who's in the room just to get a sense of uh, you know, who's participating in this. Um, and so if you could quickly mark uh, the, your background um, on the first poll question, um, that should be on the screen uh, coming up uh, now. Um, then we can get into the discussion. Are we having uh, challenges with the poll? Oh, here you go. All right, just please mark quickly, you know, what type of company you represent and so we can get a sense of uh, the, uh, the participants in the room. All right, I think we can, we can probably. Good, so we do have a, you know, a largest group in the, is on the startup side. We have enterprises and we have a, a good third that are you know, non-categorized uh, here. Um, well, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for having this. Great, so we can, we can probably take that poll off again. All right, well, let's get into, um, let's get into the conversation. Um, as we're now in the fourth month of the uh, COVID pandemic, um, how would you describe your current status of investment activities? Is it uh, business as usual? Are you suspending activities? Are you accelerating activities? Or is it uh, you know, very selective compared to the time, I guess, up to February this year? Um, and um, you know, maybe, Pat, would you, uh, would you like to start? Sure. Um... So at the Band of Angels, uh, we are continuing to hold all of our screening and due diligence activities. Um, we're doing them all online. Uh, so that, that's a little different, but, uh, uh, and we have 160 members. We're the oldest uh, angel investment organization, uh, I believe in the US and certainly in, in the Bay Area. Um, so, so things are not uh, as usual, not just from the fact that we're not meeting uh, socially uh, and and building relationships that actually help us uh, execute on on deals, uh, but we have trusted relationships for many years, so that helps uh, in in this time. And uh, we we are looking for extraordinary opportunities that happen in down markets, so we haven't cut anything off. Um, uh, and we believe uh, that uh, it's more difficult to raise funding. So often some of the best opportunities to come to angel investors come in down markets. Now, having said that, 
we also attempt to keep more of our powder dry as each individual investor for follow on rounds so that we can continue to support uh, you know, some really great companies we have in our portfolios and not, not have them uh, be uh, impacted even more greatly than they are today with the extended sales cycles um, and longer times to close. Uh, and, and so um, the valuations are, are down. Uh, there are uh, not more honors terms, but certainly milestone based terms in, um, uh, in funding documents, uh, in, in term sheets. So that's the kind of thing that we're seeing. And uh, uh, I think our activity is off a bit like the general market, uh, but we are uh, still actively uh, pursuing uh, deals. Uh, if, if, if you will, the bar is a little higher in terms of, uh, you know, what, what value are they creating uh, and when can they be cash flow positive? Excellent. Thank you. Um, how does it look uh, over at uh, Quest, uh, Andy? Yeah, I, I, um, I share a lot of the, uh, the, the thoughts. Um, <clears throat> at Quest, we continue to make investments. We continue to meet uh, through video conference. And we actually issued our first term sheet last week to, uh, to two founders that uh, we had never met physically in person, but only through Zoom after I would say probably around six meet Zoom meetings. Uh, we're still in negotiation with them, um, going back and forth on the term sheet, but that would be our first deal that we uh, organize uh, video pure video conference if that um, uh, um, comes to fruition. Um, I guess diligence becomes more important, you know, talking to people who have actually met the founders um, before COVID um, to get a better feeling. How is it working with individual or whatnot? Um, because honestly, an early stage where we invest in Series C, C plus kind of, um, it's all about investing in the founders. You know, the founders are the ones who are going to implement the idea. The idea could be obviously tremendous, but if you don't have the founder actually implementing the idea and building out a team behind it, it's not going to happen. So we really value and pick up on a lot of the uh, uh, body language and, and uh, communication and, and, and how they treat other people when we actually meet with them or we'll go for lunch and we'll see how they, how they interact with a waiter. You know, small cues like that, that unfortunately we can't pick up on right now. That being said, you know, we'll change the way that we do our diligence a bit. Um, and we're gonna continue to push forward. Um, but yes, the pace has slowed down. There's no doubt, just unfortunately because uh, um, I don't think there are as many people feeling that this is an opportune time to raise money as well as a new startup. So we focused a lot on our existing startups to make sure that they had enough liquidity to take them through this crisis. And, you know, in the beginning, especially, we, don't, we didn't know how long this crisis would last. So how much do you need to raise? It was a big, big question. We can talk about that more later. But I think um, there are a lot of uh, founders who also realize that this is probably not the best environment to try to be raising money and that if um, you do try to raise money um, or if you try to you know sell part of the company it's more of a fire sale than anything so to a certain extent i think the supply is decreasing a bit of new startups looking to raise money um, that being said i think the environment though to create a startup right now is very 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 um, uh, good because you uh, bring this culture of, of thriftiness spendthrift and efficiency uh, when you start the car startup right now. So I think it's actually an opportune time to, if you can start a startup now and bring on people and install this uh, culture of uh, efficiency into the startup, um, it's a w wonderful time. Excellent, well, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, that, that summary. Um, how does it look uh, um, at, uh, at venture, uh, at, at a corporate venture with the Hella Ventures? Uh, you probably have a few different uh, you know, streams of, of factors uh, you know, affecting your, your current environment. Uh, Marco, maybe your thoughts. Yeah, you know, I think when things are going well, that's the times when we are least creative because we're busy with dealing with things, uh, you know, getting things done. Um, we're just in our, uh, you know, in our little uh, uh, fixed route that we, that we, uh, that we know and, and there is no need to change. There's no need to be very creative on what we could do differently. And I think um, the pandemic COVID-19 was an excellent opportunity to rethink 
markets, to rethink products, and to rethink also um, the product portfolio of a company like Hella. Uh, and, and also in markets that they haven't been active in the past that are developing because of COVID-19. So this is something that only a major disruption of our lives will allow. Uh, and also discussions about these topics will be much more heard during a time of change uh, with uncertainty uh, and, and not in a time where things are going well. So that said, um, it was a great opportunity for us to reposition our investment strategy uh, in two ways. One, uh, in expanding in other markets, and two, in ways that make the company more productive uh, in terms of enterprise SaaS, uh, in terms of industry 4.0, logistics, and, and many more. So um, it's, been, it's been a great opportunity to, to find new deals that were not really accessible to us in the past because we were focusing mainly on product related investments. Of course, the entire uncertainty also leads to the fact that, yeah, if you don't have to raise, then you're not going to raise because why would you accept a, a lower valuation if you don't have to? Um, and of course, many VCs are slowing down because they're uncertain as well. So you don't want to make a, an investment in a company and then risk that a few months later, that use case is not going to apply anymore because the world just changed. Uh, so I think if you will look back and then two years and we'll look over a two year average or a year year average over two years uh, of how much money was deployed. I don't think it's going to be any different than before or after COVID. But of course, if you read Forbes and other magazines, how they, they report that numbers are down, it's simply because of uncertainty. There's less demand, there's less supply in terms of willingness to deploy right now. But um, funding from, from, from VCs, uh, from, uh, from, from funds that are funded, of course, it's not going to go away. Um, so for us, it was, um, we, we actually just closed on Friday our first all COVID deal, uh, never met the founders. I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a bit of an advantage having a good network um, where you can effectively do the due diligence by knowing people that like friends of friends, uh, not necessarily by meeting them. I think that that is going forward is of course going to be harder. And I think also for our friends that are more on the early stage, stage angel side, much harder if you can't meet, meet the founders. Uh, for us, um, it's been okay, but uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's time for us to go back to work and uh, back to our society life so that we can pick up our jobs uh, the way they were before. Good, good overview. So it, so it seems, uh, my impression is, it seems everybody's still working. They're still looking at opportunities. You know, maybe the, the, the overall uh, volume of deals has slowed a little bit, has, uh, has been reduced just because of, you know, as Pat mentioned, potentially also a, a, you know, a diminished supply of companies that are now actually out there raising. Um, you know, I've, I've had actually heard two, two you know, perspectives on this. Some are saying, you know, raise as much as you can, as long as you can, because we don't know what's coming. And other people, you know, might be, you know, might be in a better position to say, well, we're going to weather this and, and may not raise at a time when potentially valuations are not as good. Now, I'd like to expand on the topic of, of valuation. I think a couple of you brought it up. Um, what, what do you see there exactly? I mean, is it, and, and, and how, how extreme is it? How, how much have valuations been, been impacted? It would be good to, uh, to maybe have a bit more detail around that topic. Um, Marco, if you, uh, if you would like to maybe start this one. Yeah, I, I think valuations are down significantly. So we're not talking about uh, 10, 20 percent. We are talking about, you know, 50 percent sometimes or more. Um, but I also think that valuations were completely out of range uh, in, in the past year or two. Uh, and, and even like three, four years ago, you know, Series A uh, was somewhere located at 20 to 30 million posts. And, and now we've seen Series A's at 100 posts sometimes or even more, which is, is crazy. Um, without having a product often um, uh, or any customer traction. But I think it, it's, it's more there where it should be. Um, but but um, both, both of the things that you've heard are, are generally true. So if you, if you need money and, uh, you know, first of all, it depends when you heard them because at the beginning of the crisis, we didn't know how long this was going to last. So yeah, if, if you can raise money at a decent valuation, do it, why not? But there's also the tool of venture debt and, and other tools. Um, and of course, towards, towards the middle, like uh, a month and a half ago, 
yeah, if, if you don't have to raise and there's enough money in the bank, then, then just don't. It, it's going to be fine. We'll, we'll be fine and we'll just raise six months later. So it really depends on the situation of the company. Okay. Okay. Andy, how are you seeing this, uh, the valuation topic at, uh, at Quest? Yeah, I think also it has to do with the stage of financing. Um, you know, the latter stage, the growth stage companies, um, I think we're already being impacted by valuation with the whole SoftBank Vision Fund blow up and the realization that people can't continue to just pump in money with, uh, uh, without profit expectations. Um, and so you had pressure from the, from the, from the growth stage. Early stages, um, if you're talking about seed, you know, it's usually, it's already, you, I would say, I would say stuff that we're seeing is probably anywhere from 15 to 25% valuation wise cheaper than I would have imagined a year before. And there's also a lot of people who are just trying to extend their seed round um, and, and, and put in more money at the same terms as they had raised a year ago. So that's, that's what I'm seeing from a valuation standpoint. Um, I, uh, I think the, the good companies and the ones with solid invest, existing investors have already done an inside round or a bridge round uh, in order to give them cushion to pull through for the next year. Uh, the ones that weren't able to uh, do a bridge round from existing investors for n numerous reasons, either performance or just that their existing investors don't have the uh, capability to uh, continue to invest are probably the ones that are going to be struggling a bit more and have to come down on valuation and terms as well as uh, liquidation preferences probably. Um, yeah, so yes, it is, a, it is uh, the, the valuations, I think the leverage is more on the investor side at the moment compared to the past two, three years. Um, but the biggest impact though is, uh, is more on the growth stage where you're getting like pressure from uh, the vision fund debacle as well as now COVID. Mm. Pat, uh, you, you may not be seeing as, as uh, many priced rounds uh, at your stage, but you know, what's your sentiment that you're, you're seeing out there in the market? Well, uh, <clears throat> a couple of comments to, to uh, uh, complement the, uh, the ones that are already made. Uh, f first of all, um, what, what we're seeing in, in the market is um, uh, that certain people that were in doing some uh, uh, you know, the VCs like to call them venture capital tourists. Th those people kind of back out first uh, and go back to what they typically do. So that reduces the amount of funds and helps avoid bidding up uh, valuations from people that aren't typically in the venture capital market. The other thing that limits some of the funds is that limited partners based on now the stock market the public markets have come back very quickly um your guess is as good as mine whether they collapse again once the earnings uh you know uh, season comes around and some companies are doing very well on earnings other companies are not and ultimately that's got to be reflected in their stock price multiple um, so, so one of the things that we, th we think is holding up the market is the tremendous infusion of cash, uh, and it's driving up, uh, uh, the public markets. So most, most, uh, uh, limited partners aren't seeing capital calls. So, so we're, we're in pretty good shape. If the public markets decline and they start receiving capital calls because they, they are, uh, overextended, then you're going to find that a number of VCs are going to reduce some of their investment further. Now, let me change gears and, and offer this insight. Typically, you know, if you have two years of runway, we advise, you know, what, what milestones do you have to achieve to, to get the next round of financing? Today, our advice is you should have two years of runway in cash. And if you don't, cut the expenses so that you do. So that's very different. Typically, you'd wait till you had nine to 12 months and then go out and fundraise. Today, uh, we're, a number of, of uh, people are advising that you have at least two years worth of cash on hand. Uh, and, and of course, 
uh, you, that will extend if you're closing deals. But what we're finding is all of our portfolio companies, it's t the, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the time uh, to close a deal, to initiate uh, a lead and then close the deal, that's stretching out for a host of reasons. So, so those are the, uh, uh, those are, uh, are my comments to, uh, I agree with the other uh, two gentlemen, Andrew and, and Marco on what's happening with valuations. Uh, I, there, I guess one other point, uh, Jens, um, if you don't wanna penalize uh, uh, a firm uh, that, that is growing nicely and has met some really good milestones, you can consider offering them a milestone cap sheet or a term sheet. Uh, and, and what that means is that, okay, well, if you accomplish A, your valuation uh, will be this. If you accomplish B, your valuation is higher. If you accomplish C, then your valuation might be exactly what it was under the frothy market that we had before. And uh, that limits the risk on the investor side. And if the company can perform, uh, it, it's not penalized in today's down market. So those are some thoughts. Good, good, good points. Uh, and as the conversation is moving a little bit into the direction of uh, you know, portfolio companies, uh, many investors initially, when you talk to them in, in, in April and, and even still in May, we're saying, you know, we're, our first priority is to, to basically help and support our own portfolio companies. And then we're looking at you know, any new uh, investment opportunities. Um, how has that, uh, how have you, um, uh, how have you been able to communicate and, and direct your own portfolio companies uh, to res respond to this crisis? Uh, um, Andy, uh, how was that over at, uh, at Quest? Yeah, so um, definitely as soon as the, the in late March, um, the COVID uh, um, pandemic started to uh, scare the markets and the lockdown happened and people realized that uh, the economy was at a standstill and there wouldn't be much activity and that there'd be a new, new uh, approach towards how business is done. Um, I guess uh, the biggest question everyone's on the VC's mind was, okay, what was, what's the liquidity situation of the investments that we have so far? Now, um, so each startup did their own liquidity analysis, see how much money they have, can last how long without making any revenue, depending on which startup they are, which industry they are. And then they also um, look to see how can we raise funds? Can we raise internally with a, with a note with existing investors? And if not, can we raise outside under what, term, uh, what sort of terms? As well as um, looking at um, government programs, right? The payment um, check um, uh, protection program was one that all these startups that I'm a board member of, we took a deep look at and um, two of them ended up uh, receiving PPP uh, protection money uh, because they were severely impacted by the uh, um, uh, uh, COVID uh, on the market. Whereas one was also impacted, but was able to raise money um, through existing investors. So didn't meet that certification. Um, <clears throat> it was, um, you know, I think liquidity because people didn't know how long the the lockdown would last, how, how much of an impact this will have on their businesses was key. People may feel a little more comfortable now. Um, that being said, I personally believe that we're gonna be dealing with a rolling kind of waves of, of, of the COVID coming back and forth, back and forth, putting us potentially back in lockdown again will happen. So I think we may need to extend our thought towards how much runway uh, we need. Uh, but yeah, initially it was all about liquidity, all about liquidity, making sure you have enough money to survive past this pandemic. Great, thank you, um, Marco. Um, Hella has built a, you know quite quite a, quite a nice portfolio of startups over the last four years. How uh, how are you advising them on um, and supporting them in this uh, in this situation? Yeah, I mean, there's a multitude. I mean, we we did the same thing, of course, in the beginning. Uh, you know, build your list. Who, who could be struggling? Uh, have a conversation with everyone. Uh, try to understand who needs money. And um, um, the one thing that is, I think, different for us than for Andrew and, and for Patrick is that uh, we, we typically try not to lead rounds because we think that financial VCs in Series A and B should really lead the rounds. That uh, if, if a strong financial VC uh, is not willing to give a company money and, and um, you know, our market is still hot enough uh, that, that 
there's probably something wrong why we are the ones that should lead around. Um, so, and I think ultimately really the uh, very close advising of, of uh, going through all the numbers is more a lead investor. You know, that's typically where the company goes. They go to their lead investor. Uh, we, of course, um, you know, advise on what do we think about the automotive market? How is it developing? What, what uh, we, we've used all the resources that we have from our sales teams, for example, to try to understand how things are being pushed out, uh, what they have to expect. And, um, you know, that, that then reflects, of course, into their runway. Um, and of course, things that we see then is very clearly, look, um, cut your, uh, cut your uh, workforce to something that the company can sustain. Uh, and, um, uh, many benefits, uh, you know, that are typical for Silicon Valley companies, I think, uh, were removed and um, many companies now could, could extend their runway significantly. We, we see sometimes up to 100% more runway uh, with, these, uh, um, uh, with these constraints. Of course, it's not the best way to, how to grow, but uh, that's, that's the best way how to sustain cash for now. Um, so that's, that's uh, the process that we have been going through. Yeah, I think we mentioned already capital efficiency is, has really become in the you know, focus, uh, focus of attention. Uh, Pat, you already mentioned it. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts to add of, of what you would tell your portfolio companies right now? Well, the, the, I have a couple of thoughts. Well, for, first thing we did was ask them how they would cut their expenses. And after, after they responded how they might do that, we asked them to cut further. Uh, and that comes from experience in 1987, in the early 90s, in 2001, and 2008. Uh, it, it, it just is a lot harder to, to bring the sales back. Now, having said that, um, what we advise our portfolio companies to do is to get even closer to their customers. What are the opportunities to upsell and cross-sell? With new leads that you have, stop trying to sell what you've got. Listen to what the customer's problem is today. And look, if, it, if there's no fit, then you know, it's, you're gonna have to walk away from that lead. But if there's a way for you to solve part of that problem in partnership with some other companies in the field that you know of, then put a proposal together that serves the customer and not just continue to sell what you have. So, uh, and then I really want, want to, uh, uh, you know, piggyback or pile on to Andrew's comment from earlier. Uh, you know, these are really good times in terms of building uh, resilient entrepreneurs. You know, uh, entrepreneurs get sloppy. I think it was Marco uh, may have talked about that. When times are good, valuations are high and they can raise money when they have to because, you know, they've got some traction and they've got some pretty cool technology. Uh, you know, you get sloppy and, uh, you know, uh, necessity is always the mother of invention and it has always been a key to success to operate on other people's money and be really cost effective. And these kind of crises force you to do that. So those would be my comments, get closer to customers. Um, and uh, if you've cut, figure out how to cut again. And you, the, 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 the problem is, is you don't wanna die, uh, you know, <laughs> suffer a death of a thousand cuts. You wanna do a cut and do it deeply enough at the beginning, so you so you don't keep doing that. That's an incredible distraction to the company. Some of us that had to do that in 2001, 2008, um, have the painful scars from from that. So hopefully, uh, the new folks can uh, can learn from that experience. Excellent. So as as we now shift the conversation more towards the you know what will the future bring? How does how do I reposition myself as a startup in in uh, in, in maybe a more appropriate and a relevant environment that's relevant to, uh, to, to COVID. Um, we've, see, we've all seen a number of startups in the last few you know, weeks, couple of months, to either come up with new use cases that are now relevant in the COVID environment, 
or you know possibly even completely pivot into a new direction i mean i'm i'm, I'm in touch with one automotive startup that's now going into the medical field um so those opportunities exist how do you think about those and and would you encourage you know companies to do that um you know if if it happens too much and if it only becomes sort of a token repositioning then of course some of these these things may not hold too much value how do you view this maybe marco if you wanted to start yeah so i think you have to think about it in two ways that's at least how i think about it um so there is a COVID world and there's a post-COVID world. And I think many people, at least that's my opinion, um, are confusing the COVID world with the post-COVID world. Um, I think the post-COVID world, we're seeing it today that is not going to be the COVID world. Uh, and um, some of the changes that we have implemented during COVID are not sustainable. Uh, and I think many people you know, can't wait to get out again. And even things that seem to be very silly, like going to a bar, for example, that's, technically something silly if you think about it. Uh, people want to do that and we see that in other states. Um, so uh, I, I think when you reposition your company, you have to think about, is this something short term that can bring revenue, that can help me to sustain the company? But ultimately what drives the valuation of the company is the belief that the ultimate product, the ultimate whatever the company is doing in the future is what drives the valuation. And if the post COVID world hasn't changed significantly for that company, you shouldn't reposition it. Uh, and that uh, is, I think, something that people are doing too quickly um, because the world is dynamic. Uh, it's, it's not this, what it is today and in three months to say, uh, and we're building products for these three months. So we need to think about what is the world in three months. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you can build uh, and help society by building uh, medical devices in this time or where there is a need and Luckily, you might be able, able to, to get some revenue for that. Great, um, but reposition the entire company only if it makes sense in a post-COVID world. Okay, excellent. Uh, Pat, um, any thoughts on pivots and repositionings? Um, I, I'd like to be able to cite a specific research report, but, but pivots often fail. Um, so I don't have the the specific research, but, um, and they, they not only fail, um, you know, based on not having a far enough vision um, in terms of how the world's gonna, gonna evolve as, as Marco has uh, nicely articulated, but you, if you pivot and you've got an existing product and it's a totally new market, you have no presence in that market. You don't have any of the distribution infrastructure. You don't have the trusted relationships. So the sales cycle gets long and it's very difficult to get that traction. If, if you develop new product in a new market, that's even riskier. So the pivots that have, have a likelihood of being successful are product extensions that may better suit taking your existing product and tailoring that to the immediate needs so that you know it solves a problem today in the covid world but you know doesn't take you off your trajectory to uh, you know what the market's going to look like when it comes back so so pivots um, you know are are something that that term is, is well used in an environment where you're tr trying to do customer discovery. If you've already picked a market segment uh, and you're starting to get traction, uh, you want to tailor it to address immediate needs, but going to a new market or a new product is really risky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andy, on, uh, on yeah, your- I like, I like Marco's uh, <coughs> assessment of COVID world and post COVID. Um, but I think within that you have also different layers, meaning, <clears throat> so for instance, we have one company that was a, is an OTA, online travel agency, um, they, but they cater towards small and medium sized businesses. Obviously when with COVID, uh, travel has stopped, business travel has, has really been put to a halt and um, their revenue has uh, suddenly dropped off the cliff. 
um, for them, what should they do? Should they pivot or should they try to find maybe uh, an ancillary business that is similar to what they do <clears throat> and try to introduce a new product or should they try to weather it out? Um, what, what they're doing is, you know, they're cutting costs to the bare minimum so that they can survive until people start to travel again as a first, as a first. And then with those limited resources, they're going to try to see if they can expand their offerings without losing focus of what their core business is. We have though companies that are excelling within the COVID environment. Um, ProGuides, it's a uh, company that teaches uh, um, uh, players, gamers, um, how to excel within their esports. And you can have live tutors and play with an expert player. And, um, and it's taking off obviously because many people are spending more time online uh, within this COVID lockdown environment. We also have another company called uh, um, Coffee Meets Bagel. You know, they're a dating app. People can't go to the restaurant and meet each other anymore. But, you know, you can actually do video conferences and try to meet with one another. So how do you kind of evolve your product to meet the situation and hopefully come out of COVID even better? So I guess, the, I mean, I think it's also important to realize that there are some companies that may suffer now, but actually could even be uh, more beneficial post COVID. For instance, Airbnb, yes, it is travel and people aren't traveling right now. But once we get out of this COVID situation, don't you think people would rather stay at a house as opposed to a hotel with a busy lobby and lots of people? You feel much more comfortable not getting uh, infected by potentially staying at a house that's all to yourself, right? So I think maybe even though Airbnb is getting crushed right now, they may come out even more successful post COVID. So it's very interesting to see all these different type of um, um, scenarios playing out and the impact of COVID. Obviously you wanna be in the one that you come out of COVID with um, an even better product and, and a higher um, growth potential. Yeah, so, so, so at a high level, there's really two, two strategies. One is a hibernation strategy, which would be the Airbnb. You, you cut mm -hmm. costs, you, you're, you, you, you know, what, what are you going to pivot to? You, you might be able to pivot to some other things, um, but certainly that market's not there. So clearly a hibernation strategy, uh, which was one of the alternatives that Andrew uh, suggested is, is most likely the strategy they need to follow. The other is, you know, if you are well healed in cash and you can cut expenses, this is an extraordinary time to buy other assets at greatly reduced prices and maybe expand your product offering uh, and increase the, uh, you know, how, how you can serve customers. But in, in making that acquisition, you're bringing product knowledge, you're bringing market knowledge, and uh, maybe it's better suited to the, the COVID world and will generate more revenue. So, uh, you know, if, if you're Cisco and you've got deep pockets, this is a great time to be Cisco. Just buy up everybody that's failing, right, from a financial standpoint. Um, but if, if you're Airbnb, maybe the best strategy is hibernation. Right. No, good point. I mean, clearly, there are industries and, and, and market segments that are, that are absolutely benefiting from the situation. And the question is, you know, is this, uh, is this more of a short term uh, phenomenon or is it, uh, is it a longer term strategy that, that should be attached to this? And others, you know, hibernation might be, might be the option for, uh, for Airbnb. Uh, you know, others might just look at capital efficiency and somehow, you know, get through this uh, one way or another. Um, as, um, as we want to also give uh, the participants a chance to ask some questions, um, I would ask you one, one final question. Um, uh, regarding the, the, the outlook, the investment climate outlook, as you look into the end of this year and, the, and, and, and potentially then uh, 2021, how do you see things changing? Do you think we're going to pop out of this uh, you know, at some point after this year and then things will slightly go back to normal? Or are we, are we basically best bracing for a post-COVID world that looks somewhat different than what we've known before? Um, Anybody who has an instant thought uh, would like to start. Um, maybe, maybe a word. Uh, I think there are two things that uh, will drive the next few months. Uh, so the one is that I think 
it's still going to be hard to meet. Um, so uh, happy hours, uh, meetups, or also in-person meetings are still going to be hard. I think it's probably going to stay like this at least until the end of the year, until we have, probably have a vaccine, if we want to be responsible. Um, but I think we know what the virus does and how it behaves and how to control it. The contact tracing and testing is, is become much better. So I think we know what the post-COVID world would kind of look like. So um, I think these two things will drive, I think, a little bit less activity. But um, to be honest, valuations will start picking back up slowly because once, you know, ultimately it's always what is the ultimate value of the company. Somebody asked about markets um, uh, as well, public markets. Valuation is and liquidity and valuation and earnings is for me uh, something very different, and that's really what drives valuations is um, or what what drives it down is uncertainty, and I think the uncertainty is kind of like slowly getting out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Andy, do you have uh, a perspective on this? Yeah. Um, so post COVID, uh, I would say. <clears throat> I would say that um, there's going to be some interesting um, new processes that um, new startups can um, um, capitalize upon, um, starting with obviously how people work and interact with one another professionally. Um, I think a lot of people aren't going to go on the plane to show that product demo anymore when they can do the same thing over video conference. Um, Likewise, with, uh, with offices and rent, and um, how is that going to change? I think there will be a decrease um, um, in office space rented. And how, how will that impact the, um, the, uh, the uh, landowners and investors? Uh, and, their, and where will they deploy that cash instead? Um, I, also believe, I also believe that um, people, unfortunately, will be a little bit more timid and not as uh, uh, willing to take risks. The mentality of uh, the consumer, um, unfortunately, will take some time to, to heal. I'm not saying it's never going to heal, but, uh, um, and so with that, how do you change um, your marketing tactics uh, to individuals? And then finally, um, logistics is a big, big, uh, I think there'll be a big change in and trying to, you know, the, the idea of globalization, I, I'm a big support of it, but I think you're gonna see um, a lot of countries try to manage um, essential items, try to manage uh, logistical items um, more nationally as opposed to internationally. And that's gonna change uh, supply routes um, and approach towards uh, logistics. Great, thank you. Uh, Pat, some uh, final words on the outlook? I, I think that was a, a great summary, um, uh, Andrew and, and Marco. Um, th there, there will be some things that will, will be part of new norms. And, and I think um, whether those new norms break down is whether we have effective um, uh, vaccinations, effective safe vaccinations. And, and then I think you're going to get to closer to the old normal. If those vaccinations uh, aren't effective or safe, uh, then it's going to take a lot longer and uh, we will have a very radically different new wow. normal. Wow. Uh, and uh, with regard to globalization, I'm very concerned. I, the latest numbers I saw is that in the last three months, uh, the uh, global GDP w was down about 5%. Some people are projecting that it might be down only 3% for the year. That's still a huge number. And um, what, what I'm concerned about is that w w globalization makes the pie get bigger for everybody. And then everybody gets a, sh a slice of the pie. Um, I think it is appropriate to, as Andreessen um, uh, has written, to look at building some stuff internally uh, or, or, or do more building. Uh, and he talks about having some internal stuff, uh, you know, th things that are critical supply. So, so at the national level, at the federal level in the US uh, or Germany, um, I think Germany is, is in better shape than, than the US because there's been a lack of vision in terms of 
strategic uh, industry investment. Um, now, ha having having said that, uh, while I think you want to you want to bring some things back on shore, I think the fact that globalization has elevated hundreds of millions of people in China out of poverty is a tremendous benefit to the entire world. And if if you radically redo the supply chains and incent everybody to come back, then you've got you've created a new instability in the world and that global economic pie gets smaller and smaller. And uh, that's not good. And hopefully there'll be enough wisdom in our politicians to not let that happen. Thanks for the opportunity, Jens. Well, thank you. Um, um, you, touched on, um, you touched on a great uh, topic. Uh, I, I would like, I uh, wanted to actually discuss the Andreessen article a little bit today. Uh, we're running quickly out of time, um, but I would recommend everybody um, uh, take the time and read Mark Andreessen's article, It's Time to Build, it's on the website, uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Um, a really, really good provocative article that, uh, that's making great points. Um, I want to go now and, and, and still give, uh, give participants a chance to ask some questions. I have a number of questions here that were actually asked uh, when people registered. We have a few on the chat as well. So let's, uh, let's, let's move to those. There's a question here from the participant that's saying, you know, how does the funding landscape look, uh, look like for first time founders uh, in this environment? Obviously, you know, it's much easier to fund people that have a track record. Uh, how would you, you know, would you encourage people now to actually come out or uh, is that uh, something that's become a little bit more difficult? Anybody who wants to raise their hand and, and have an answer? More, more difficult, much more difficult. Much more difficult, right? I mean, I think Marco was talking about talking to friends of friends and friends of, uh, of your founders, right? And if you have that network, but otherwise, it's it's more difficult. Anybody else? Some, uh... I, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm a little bit torn. Um, much more difficult because without network, very hard to do due diligence on the person. Uh, if you can't meet them, almost impossible. Um, a lot of the accelerators on the other side that, that rely on the shotgun kind of like approach of investing um, still want to run their uh, their their, um, their batches. Uh, so you know, less entrepreneurs coming in. It's the chance of getting in uh, uh, maybe a little bit a little bit better, uh, but in general, yeah, this is a business that relies on on connections and and somehow you gotta be able to you know do the you did due diligence on the person and without meeting them without track record, uh, it's definitely harder. Yeah, no, I I I, I agree. Uh, Andy, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, in general, I I I, I agree as well. I think. Um, it's also important for first-time investors and first-time uh, founders um, to be able to uh, I, to be able to communicate with a venture capitalist in a manner that assures and meets expectations that the venture capitalist feels as though the founder knows what he's he or she is getting into um, and can maneuver the landscape of a of a startup ecosystem. Um, an idea in itself, like I said before, is wonderful, but unless you implement that, you know, it doesn't mean anything. So now how's that different in a COVID or a non-COVID environment? Um, maybe it's more difficult to, for founders to find other co-founders that may have that experience, that the technical know-how, or even just a startup experience that, you know, having, having gone through a, creating your own startup, um, I'm sure there's a bunch of different walls that you hit that if you had experienced previously, um, it's much quicker to, over, to climb over that wall as opposed to if it's the first time for you hitting it. And by having co-founders or other people who have encountered that before, I think you're able to overcome these difficult situations much quicker. Um, okay. By not being able to meet or, have, or, or bring on co-founders um, that have experienced that, in this COVID environment, because I think a lot of people do go and meet other co-founders through startup meetups and whatnot, which probably aren't occurring as much, also makes it a bit more difficult. So in general, yes, I think it's, it's, it's more difficult right now, but I wouldn't let that discourage you. I mean, at the end of the day, um, um, if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, M more, more difficult to meet people, but very frankly, more people are available. 
Very true. Very true. Um, now, here's a here's a somewhat dis, um, you know, related question. You know, how important is geographic location now for early stage investment? Now that we're doing everything remotely, anyhow. I mean, it used to be and very very critical also for networking purposes to be here in Silicon Valley. Now, are you funding companies that are actually further away? Um, what's the what's what's sort of that uh, that sentiment there? We're not making an making a, an effort to fund companies that are further away because we're in a COVID environment. Um, I think more importantly for us is to make sure under which country's law is the company incorporated. Um, we at Silicon at Quest Venture Partners, I'd say ninety percent of our investments are in Silicon Valley, then Los Angeles, Seattle, and New York, and then we have a couple in Asia. Um, but you know, being able to, um, in the past, hop in your car and go to their office and make sure that they're there and talk to them is a big, big uh, uh, reason why we wanted to be in Silicon Valley. Uh, yes, that's uh, um, decreasing right now, especially in this environment. But in general, I think just with um, that, the notion of um, video conferencing um, as a mean of communication is just has improved and people are, are more comfortable with it. All right. Well, thank you. Um, anybody else a thought on, on location? Otherwise, um, I think we're ready to, you know, close the official panel discussion and then move on to networking. Uh, any final thoughts on, um, on the it's, question? It's, it's, it's again, the same thing like that we said before, it's, it's all about the network. Uh, it, it's maybe a little bit less relevant. Actually, you know what, if you have the network here and you've been in Silicon Valley for, you know, a number of years and people know you and trust you, but your company is in Ohio, great, even better. I mean, my dollar goes twice as far in Ohio. And if you uh, know how to play the game and you have the connections here, even better. But like, unfortunately, that's not often the case. And if you are a founder in Ohio that doesn't know anyone in Silicon Valley, you just don't know who to talk to and uh, how, to, how to gauge the different, the, the, the different funds and the different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, good point. Uh, I think we're running out of time and some people actually moving on to, uh, you know, other um, calls. So I would like to uh, thank our three panelists very much for this uh, very insightful conversation. Obviously, this is a big, big topic and we were only able to touch on so many, uh, you know, parts and topics and, uh, and um, questions uh, in that uh, limited time. But um, if